Thank you very much, Professor Yehudai. Um, Mrs. Ross, ladies and gentlemen. After Auschwitz, there can be no poetry. So famously wrote Theodor Adorno. Also, he is reputed to have written. Actually, he didn't write that. His actual words were more subtle, but less aphoristic, expressed with characteristic Teutonic obscurity. Uh, and in any case, he subsequently withdrew uh, what he'd earlier written. The misquoted phrase has nevertheless stuck in the phrase book of conventional wisdoms as his best known pronouncement. Now, of course, if taken literally, uh, it's demonstrably untrue. One need only cite such names as Nelly Zaks, Paul Celan, Itzik Manger, and Abba Kovner as illustrations that after Auschwitz, poetry was not only possible, but could draw inspiration directly from the, the, the horrors of the genocide of the Jewish people. And to those names I might add others, such as A.M. Klein or Leonard Cohen. If poetry after Auschwitz was possible, so a fortiori was prose. And the two or three decades after the liberation of the camps gave rise to an outpouring of publication by thinkers who struggled to find meaning in the Jewish past, present, and future. Primo Levi, George Steiner, and others among them lamented the inadequacy of language after Auschwitz, yet they and others nonetheless wrote voluminously, often eloquently, sometimes angrily, and in many cases with perceptiveness and originality. And their debates in the post-war years were more than just background noise to the demographic, geographic, and political convulsions in the Jewish world after 1945. This body of work, this body of literature, not only constitutes an archive of commentary on the rapidly evolving Jewish condition in the post-war period, the broader Jewish public drew upon this intellectual inventory to construct frameworks of understanding for the dilemmas that confronted them in the face of successive existential challenges in those post-war years. And broadly speaking, there were four such frameworks available to Jews after 1945. There were others, but these four were the the most important. And those are the ones I want to talk about today. The first was, of course, Judaism itself. Religious adherence and secularization are notoriously difficult phenomena to measure. Nonetheless, there is evidence from much of the Jewish world in the late 1940s that Judaism, and in particular Orthodox Judaism, was in retreat, especially among young people. In the early post-war period, a number of religious thinkers sought to reinvigorate traditional Judaism so as to reverse the visible decline in its appeal that had been registered clearly already before the war. But, broadly speaking, they failed to stimulate a broad-based religious revival and a brief tour d'horizon of post-war Jewry will, I think, confirm this. Let's start in the USA. So far as America is concerned, some ultra-Orthodox groups from Eastern Europe, it's true, succeeded in reconstituting their communities. But they remained a tiny segment of the Jewish population, for the most part voluntarily ghettoized from the rest of Jewry. Theologians such as Emanuel Rachman and Abraham Heschel did much to revivify 
the thought of, conservative, of Orthodox and Conservative Judaism, respectively. Yet, it was Reform Judaism that remained by far the largest of the three religious streams in the USA in that post-war period. Orthodox Jews then, as incidentally now, constituted fewer than 10% of American Jewry. They may be a very loud 10%, but they are uh, a tiny minority. The reluctance of Yosef Dov Soloveitchik, the leading modern Orthodox, as it was called, authority of the period, to publish much in his lifetime, restricted his influence uh, beyond the already converted. Mordechai Kaplan, a more outward-looking and daring thinker, attracted a following among some young intellectuals. But the Reconstructionist movement that his supporters hoped would have a transformative effect on American Jewry found no mass support. As late as 1970, there existed only a handful of Reconstructionist congregations in America with just a couple of thousand members. Now, all that is not to say that American Jews in this period, uh, roughly 45 to 67, uh, precipitately abandoned their, fate, uh, their faith. Arthur Hertzberg claimed in 1964 that three-fifths of American Jews were affiliated to a synagogue and that the previous two decades had witnessed uh, what he described as the greatest single synagogue building boom in the whole of Jewish history in the diaspora. And that is certainly beyond doubt. Yet he himself noted that unlike most members of churches in America, the overwhelming majority of Jews did not attend services regularly. Synagogue membership in the USA in the 1940s and 50s was almost as much a demonstration of civic respectability as a profession of faith. Or, or perhaps one might call it a profession of faith in Americanism as much as in Judaism. In what was the second largest Jewish community in the world, still in 1945, that of the Soviet Union, any religious evangelizing was, of course, taboo. The impression is sometimes given that the dramatic decline in religious observance among Soviet Jews was primarily due to Soviet anti-religious policy. Well, that, there certainly was such a policy, but that was by no means the whole explanation. Soviet Jews had suffered the most, their most severe losses at the hands of the Nazis precisely in those areas where religiosity had been strongest before the war, namely former Eastern Poland and the Baltic states, which of course had been annexed by the USSR at the beginning of the war. In Russia, the masses of Jews who had moved to the big cities in the 1930s had already, for the most part, left their Judaism behind in the Shtetlach. Already before the war, Soviet Jews had become the most secularized group in Soviet society, suggesting that forces other than or additional to general anti-religious propaganda or coercion were in play. There's more to be said about that. Perhaps we can discuss that later. But turning to East Central European Jewry, this of course, the main pre-war center of orthodoxy, but already decaying before the war, had been wiped out by the Nazis. The people and their institutions, of course, such as the yeshivot of Poland and Lithuania. The two countries in the region with the largest uh, surviving Jewish communities in 1945, those of Hungary and Romania, had like the Soviet Union, lost their most orthodox elements. Those who survived in cities such as Budapest and Bucharest were already heavily secularized before the war. Now let's 
move on to, to Western Europe, in Britain. Rabbi Louis Jacobs, whose book, We Have Reason to Believe, published in 1957, uh, he opened a forward path for a modernized orthodoxy. And he paid the price. He was excluded from the Orthodox rabbinate by order of the chief rabbi. He won some powerful support, including from the Jewish Chronicle newspaper, the main Jewish newspaper uh, in Britain at the time. But the Masorti movement that he eventually inspired in Britain remained no more than and remains no more than a sideshow. In France, the religious philosopher André Nair tried to address the challenge, as he saw it, of the silence of God after Auschwitz. He contributed to the partial revival as an orthodox stronghold of Alsatian Jewry, which had been particularly hard hit during the war as a result of the region's reincorporation in, uh, in, in Germany. But his departure from Strasbourg to Israel uh, in the 1960s left a vacuum. In, uh, in a way that was eventually filled by uh, another philosopher, perhaps a greater one, Emmanuel Levinas. His publications were divided into two types. The first, formal philosophical works expounding phenomenological hermeneutics and ethics, or what Jacques Derrida called an ethics of ethics, uh, remained impenetrable to almost all save his post-structuralist uh, disciples. The second type, generally short essays in a different register, reached out to a broader popular audience. And in one of these, in 1959, he deplored the way in which French Judaism had congealed into what he termed a museum that, as he put it, betrays its profound essence. He went on to lament, I quote, between a thousand-year existence in which attachment to the truth remains the great affair of life, and one's place in the synagogue where one listens to the organ, the gap is after all considerable. To live dangerously for 20 centuries as Jews or as Maranos, only to end up attending pretty ceremonies. That's what he wrote. Uh, but his proposals for, for dealing with what he, for the problem as he saw it, uh, of, of Jewish religious mobilization were really quite unoriginal. He saw hope in the revival of Israel, of youth movements, and of Jewish schools. And these suggestions echoed the plans of Jewish communal leaders elsewhere in Western Europe for so-called Jewish reconstruction. Uh, one of the speakers earlier today talked about Jewish reconstruction as an architectonic uh, conception. And some historians have internalized such notions and written the history of diaspora Jewish communities in this period largely in institutional terms. <laughs> Not all, but some. To do Levinas justice, he had a more sophisticated conception of what a genuine uh, revival of Judaism might involved, involve, but his ideas remained little known until the 1960s, and in any case, he explicitly disavowed the role of a religious revivalist, and his caution was justified because French Jewry remained decidedly lukewarm in its religious enthusiasm, at any rate until the arrival of masses of North African Jews, after, particularly after 1962. Let's move on to Asia and Africa. The pattern of drift away from religion in those continents was slower than in Europe, but already evident. The Yeshuv in Palestine was led, of course, by assertively secular socialist Zionists, and the general social, socio-cultural norms of the time were, if not antagonistic to religion, clearly secular. Mizrahi, the religious Zionist political party constituted not only a very small minority among Zionists, but also a very small minority among Orthodox Jews in Palestine. Among 
Jews in Muslim countries by 1945, the secularizing wave from Europe was lapping against traditional values, traditional attitudes and values uh, there too. While customary religious observance re generally remained high, the intellectual authority of the rabbinate was declining. According to the historian Tzvi Zohar, although the Jew I'm quoting him now, although the Jewish population of these lands increased during the 19th and 20th centuries, the overall number of Chachamim, uh, Torah sages, probably decreased after 1900, reaching, he says, its lowest point in the late 1940s. And Zohar notes a consequent decrease in the number of cultural and literary works in the various genres of rabbinic writing, especially after World War I in, in, in those communities. The school system of the Alliance Israelite Universelle since the mid-19th century has not only, as is well known, increased French cultural influence among these so-called Oriental communities, it, it also simultaneously drew students away from rabbinic schools, particularly in, uh, in the Maghreb. In Iraq, as my colleague Orid Bashkin has shown, a number of young Jewish intellectuals were beginning in the late 40s to challenge the hegemony or hegemony of religious leaders. A few embraced fashionable non-Jewish spiritual movements of the time, such as theosophy. In his memoir of Jewish Baghdad in, 1940, in the 1940s, Sasson Somech, it's a wonderful memoir, I recommend it to all of you, writes, uh, he, he recalls, and I'm quoting him now, that while the number of those who considered themselves entirely secular remained small, perhaps 20%, the secular model became without a doubt a prototype that many of the young sought to imitate. So overall then, the first of the four frameworks of collective self-understanding, that of traditional Judaism, did not operate effectively in that post-war period for more than a diminishing minority of Jews. What we see in that post-war generation is, and I'm now quoting Matthew Arnold, the melancholy, long, withdrawing roar of the sea of faith. He was talking about Victorian England, but the same applies here, I submit. Now the second potential framework Marxism, more specifically communism. Now there's a danger of underestimating the appeal of communism to Jews in the immediate post-war period. I'm talking about 1945, 6, 7. It was, after all, the Red Army that had liberated Auschwitz. And by the way, not only Auschwitz, if you look at the 3,000 prison camps of all kinds uh, in the, in the uh, Nazi uh, prison system, the overwhelming majority were liberated by the Soviets, by the Red Army. In the conflict between communism and its enemies in East Central Europe in the late 1940s, the Jews, however much they wished it, could not choose neutrality. In countries such as Poland, Hungary, and Romania, Jews certainly did not hanker after a, a return to power of anti-Semitic pre-war political establishments. Consequently, communism seemed to many in Jews in Eastern Europe compatible with Jewish interests, especially during the brief period of Stalin's support for a Jewish state in Palestine uh, in 1947 and 8. As late as 1956, Many of the Jews, including some of my relatives, who trudged by night across the border from Hungary to Austria were fleeing not so much Soviet tanks in the streets of Budapest as the prospect of a return to power of right-wing revolutionaries whose sentiments were registered in anti-Semitic slogans on the walls of Budapest during the Hungarian Revolution. Jewish attraction to communism 
was not limited to Eastern Europe, where one might say it had opportunistic elements. In France, part of the Jewish working class, an important part, uh, and many Jewish intellectuals were party members at that time, so, or if not members, then supporters or fellow travelers, as the phrase went. Among these were significant intellectual figures, such as the sociologist Edgar Morin uh, or, and the orientalist Maxime Rodinson. Morin was expelled from the party in 1951. Rodinson re resigned in 58. But like other intellectual ex-communists, uh, both of those continued to regard themselves as in some sense Marxists. Different course was eventually chosen by another French Jewish intellectual, Annie Becker, later Annie Besse, later still Annie Kriegel, a former teenage participant in the resistance, who while still in her 20s was made responsible for party cultural affairs in the Paris region. She was already then a figure to be reckoned with in the theater of politics in, of the left bank uh, of the late 40s and early 50s. A vehement Stalinist, she defended the show trials of the allegedly traitorous communist leaders in Eastern Europe, uh, Slansky, for example, in Czechoslovakia, uh, several of whom were Jews. She left the party in 1957 and eventually switched from vociferous Stalinism to no less impassioned Zionism. But others remained true to the faith, held there in particular by sympathy for the Communist Party's opposition uh, to the French colonial war in Algeria. Like Jews in Eastern Europe a generation earlier, many young educated Jews in the Middle East were attracted to communism and for similar reasons. Above all, because communist internationalism seemed to open a pathway to acceptance and political participation in increasingly nationalistic societies. Jews played a very significant role in the early stages of communist organization in several Middle Eastern countries. Many suffered for their beliefs. Figures like Sasson Shlomo Dalal hanged in the main square of Baghdad in 1949, and Henri Curiel, a founding figure in the Communist Party of Egypt, who was expelled from the country in 1950 and later assassinated in Paris. Henri Alec, a London-born French communist who moved to Algeria and became editor of the communist newspaper Alger Républicain, was tortured by his French military captors. He later wrote a famous expose of his experience and that of his non-Jewish comrade, Maurice Ondin, for whose death under torture, President Macron issued official contrition just a few weeks ago. Now, the Communist Party was, of course, a major <coughs> political force in the Fourth Republic in France. The same could not be said of communism in English-speaking countries. Yet there too it attracted significant, if minority, Jewish support in that period. In the British general election of 1945, one of the three communist candidates elected to Parliament, to the House of Commons, was in the heavily Jewish constituency of Mile End in the East End of London, and an analyst has uh, calculated that he owed his victory largely to Jewish votes. In South Africa, the Communist Party's resolutely anti-racist position attracted many Jews. A police report to the Prime Minister Jan Smuts in February 1946 uh, stated that of 60 active leaders of the Communist Party, 23 out of 60 had Jewish names. The only communist in the South African parliament elected in the election of 1948 was a Jew, Sam Khan, representative of the so-called native, that's to say black, electorate in the Western Cape. Unlike in other countries, Jews in South Africa remained prominent in the leadership of the Communist Party in South Africa right down to the present. And in the United States too, Jews were drawn, of course, small minority, but still 
some were drawn to communism partly by its uncompromisingly anti-racist position. But there were other attractions, including the wartime alliance with the Soviet Union and the party's policy adopted in 1944 of working within the Democratic Party as a progressive ginger group. Around half of the 80,000 uh, US Communist Party's members in 1945 are estimated to have been Jews. And of course, as the joke goes, the other half were uh, FBI agents. Um, um, some Jewish former communists joined socialist uh, fringe groups. And the result in the late 40s was a microcosmic ideological conflict waged at white heat intensity among rival groups of communists, Bundists, Mensheviks and Trotskyists and others. Uh, the Trotskyists themselves were caught up in bitter schismatic struggles between the so-called Canaanites and Schachtmanites, mainly fought out on the battlefields of the student cafeterias of City College New York and the University of Chicago, two institutions that unlike uh, most of the Ivy League did not at that time maintain quotas limiting the number of Jewish students and as a result of course were flooded with them. Although the combatants were atheists and renounced Jewish attachments, most were by origin Jews or to use the famous phrase of the Trotskyist uh, Isaac Deutscher, non-Jewish Jews. A prominent example was the Palestinian-born Yigael Glückstein, who emigrated from Palestine to England in 1946, took the name Tony Cliff, and became a leading figure in what later came to be called the Socialist Workers' Party, one of the noisiest and most fiercely schismatic groups on the British far left. It was not only in, in those senses that the Cold War developed at certain levels into an internecine Jewish civil war. That internecine conflict was vividly symbolized by the trial in 1951, the famous trial of the alleged atom spies Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, in which not only the defendants, but the prosecuting and the defense counsel, as well as the presiding judge, were all Jews. Um, no less symbolic was the decision by the judge to advance the Rosenberg's Friday evening execution at Sing Sing by three hours so as not to transgress uh, Shabbat. As Arthur Miller later put it, they were to be killed more quickly than planned to avoid any shadow of bad taste. Um, so they were all Jews, only the executioner was a Gentile. Now, of course, as we all know, events after 1947 led to a r rapid Jewish drift away from communism. The anti-cosmopolitan campaign, as it was called in the USSR, launched in August 1946, took a decidedly anti-Jewish turn by December 1948. Um, contrary to rumors at the time, no evidence so far has been produced to substantiate the uh, the allegation that Stalin was planning a mass deportation of Jews from European to Asiatic regions of the Soviet Union. But, uh, but the execution of Yiddish writers, the show trials in Czechoslovakia and Hungary, and the suppression of the Hungarian Revolution in '56 all reduced the attractiveness of communism, particularly to Jews. Jewish intellectual progression into communism and regression from it can be traced in several autobiographical accounts, of which perhaps the most brilliant was the essay and later the extended autobiography of uh, Arthur Köstler, the Hungarian-born uh, writer at that time in the, late, in the late 40s, moving around between uh, England, France, and the USA. Uh, that essay appeared in the collection entitled The God That Failed, edited by the British Labour MP Richard Crossman, that was published in London in 1950. Kostler's novel, Darkness at Noon, 
which had been published in 1940, was until the appearance of Orwell's 1984 in 1949, the most powerful fictional indictment of communism. In the early post-war years, Kessler was one of the foremost ideological warriors against communism. The communist god having failed, Kessler abased himself for a time before another deity, Zionism. His book Promise and Fulfillment, published in 1949, was a propaganda trumpet blast of the First Order in support of the terrorist wing of the Zionist movement. Now Zionism was of course a third possible framework of Jewish self-understanding after 1945. Before 1939, it had been a minority enthusiasm among Jews. During the war, it was immeasurably weakened by the mass murder of East European Jewry. It also thereby lost much of its raison d'etre as a solution to the so-called Jewish problem, perhaps more properly called the Christian problem, in Europe. Yet after 1945, Zionism soon acquired overwhelming support in what remained of world Jewry. But that transformation was neither total nor overnight. In the critical years, 1945 to 8, many Jews still harbored doubts about the feasibility or desirability of a Jewish state. The non-Zionists included almost all ultra-Orthodox Jews, even in Palestine, many Reform Jews in the United States, as well as much of the established notable elite of British and French Jewry. When the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry inspected the so-called displaced persons camps in Germany and Austria and Italy in early 1946, majorities of Jewish survivors demanded to go to Palestine. But the extent to which they voiced opinions freely was questioned. British officials, of course anxious to limit Jewish immigration to then British-ruled Palestine, claimed that uh, uh, they had been subjected to heavy Zionist propaganda and pressure. Some uh, historians uh, maintain that particularly young Jews opted independently, voluntarily, for Zionism. There's certainly much truth in both those claims. An appreciable number of the displaced persons wished to go to places other than Palestine, such as the USA or Canada, but, but in 1946-47 found the doors of those and other similar countries closed to them. Much the same, incidentally, was true of another group of Jewish refugees, the 20,000 or so, uh, mostly from Germany, who in those years were stuck in Shanghai. Many of them were still stuck there in 1949, in some cases, many cases, after a decade uh, in exile. At that point, Israel sent a consul to organize uh, their emigration to Israel. But in the end, most of those who could manage to do so, and by the way, the Jewish community in Shanghai during the war was strongly Zionist, uh, but most of those who could exercise a choice preferred to go to Australia, South America, the United States, or in the case of more than 2,000, 10% of them, uh, back to Germany. They were the only organized group of Jews from Germany who went back voluntarily as a, as a group uh, to live there. As for the Jews in Arab lands who flocked to Israel after 1948, the great majority, of course, had not hitherto been Zionists. The effort by some Israeli historians to establish, as it were, a Zionist pedigree for them is an exercise in, if not myth-making, at any rate exaggeration. The Zionist movements in all Arab countries before 1948 were tiny. It's true that in Iraq, the Farhud, or pogrom, of 1941 had heightened Jewish insecurity and increased support for Zionism. But in 1945, the Zionist movement in Iraq still had fewer than 1,000 members. 
proud of their heritage as the oldest Jewish community of the diaspora. Well, unless one counts Egypt, I don't know. But anyway, uh, the Jews in Iraq remained deeply attached to their country. Even after the establishment of Israel and the consequent growth in hostility to Jews, many Iraqi Jews were determined to remain. It took five bombings in 1950 and 1951, as well as a series of uh, anti effectively anti-Jewish legislation, uh, um, these bombings of buildings in Baghdad that were heavily frequented by Jews, it took those finally to persuade most of the community to leave. This is much disputed, the, the, who was responsible for those bombings, but there is, uh, there is a, a serious historical uh, uh, view that these bombings were the work of Zionist agent provocateur. To a considerable extent, those Jews from Arab countries who were in a position to exercise a choice, in other words, those who could afford it, chose to move to the USA, Canada, France, or Britain. It was the utterly impoverished masses who moved or, to Israel, or, or to be more precise, were moved to Israel, because they had not the wherewithal to go elsewhere. For most of them, it was after their arrival in Israel, not before, that they reinvented themselves as Zionists. And in this respect, incidentally, they resembled German Jews of the Fifth Aliyah in the 1930s who had arrived in Palestine similarly, for the most part, having been non-Zionists or anti-Zionists in their native land. Now, the critical change in attitudes towards Zionism uh, in World Jewry in 1945 to 8 occurred among American Jews. This change is sometimes attributed to bad conscience about their alleged failure to lend succor to imperiled European Jewry between 1933 and 1945. My impression is that this too is something of a retrospective rationalization. Of course, American Jews were greatly moved by what had occurred in Europe. Most of them, after all, were, first, were still first, second-generation immigrants from Europe, and many had family members who had been murdered by the Nazis. Zionism won unprecedented support for the first time among American Jewry in this period. But it was seen more as a solution for the Jewish problem in Europe than as an existential issue directly affecting American Jews themselves, for the most part. In the form of political and financial support for Israel, Zionism in North America in the post-war period developed into a kind of civic religion. It's often been called that. And this form of Zionism was particularly well suited to American Jews, even in the McCarthyite period, since it was perfectly possible to combine patriotic Americanism with Zionism, just as Irish and Italian Americans combined their patriotism with their respective vicarious nationalisms. But these secondary identities had their limits. Israel, with its Jewish population that by 1955 had still reached only 1.6 million, that was fewer than the Jewish population of New York at the time, um, constituted only 14% of world Jewry. Even the most optimistic Zionist then could not realistically hope that within a lifetime Israeli Jews would increase to close to an absolute majority of Jews in the world, which is what the position is today. Whatever the increase, American Jews were not expected to contribute to it in significant numbers. And of course, as it turned out, they didn't. Like other so-called hyphenated ethnics, Jewish American lovers of Zion lived at both a geographical and an imaginative remove from the object of their affection. Only a tiny minority of Jews, American Jews in the late 40s had ever, had, had ever visited Eretz Israel, and while a number subscribed to Zionist funds, most did not subscribe to or even know much about Zionist ideology. Yet, the creation of Israel in 1948 created 
an immediate existential dilemma for a Jew, whether he lived in London or in New York or in Casablanca or in Moscow. However much they indignantly, as most did, rejected the accusation of double loyalties, the creation of Israel opened inevitable questions. Who were they and where did they belong? In a political sense, the issue was papered over by the uh, so-called exchange of views in 1950 between David Ben-Gurion and Jacob Blaustein, the president of the American Jewish Committee, a non-Zionist organization of notables. The Israeli prime minister declared in, in, in that exchange that the Jewish state, and I'm quoting now, had no desire and no intention to interfere in any way with the internal affairs of Jewish communities abroad. For his part, Blaustein assured Ben-Gurion that the vast majority of American Jewry recognizes the necessity and desirability of helping make Israel a strong, viable, self-supporting state. At the same time, Blaustein insisted, I quote, I would be less than frank if I did not point out to you that American Jews vigorously repudiate any suggestion or implication that they are in exile. The agreement, that agreement of 1950, in reality an agreement to differ, was formalized in a way in Israeli legislation in 1952 regulating the status and relationship of the Jewish community and the World Zionist Organization, the Jewish Agency. But all this did not resolve the fundamental difference in outlook or the dilemma. The division occur, uh, emerges, for example, in an exchange of letters in 1954 between Ben-Gurion and the Hebrew writer Shimon Ravidovich, at that time teaching at Brandeis University. Ben-Gurion expressed bluntly the Zionist doctrine of Shlilat Hagola, negation of the diaspora. As uh, Ben-Gurion put it, the Jew in the Gola is split, torn and divided between two struggling realms, and neither can be and can neither be a complete man nor a complete Jew. This was a very crude expression of, of, that, uh, of that doctrine. So, of course, the obvious question arises, were the diaspora Jews then to regard themselves as second-rate Jews? In reply to Ben-Gurion, uh, Ravidovitz advocated a co-partnership that involved what he called equality of value, rights, and responsibilities between Israel and the diaspora. He rejected, as he put it, every tendency of monopoly and hegemony in Jewish history. Although he himself was a Zionist, he argued that the diaspora must develop its own creative resources rather than becoming, as Achat Ha'am and others had envisaged, a kind of cultural dependency of, the, of a spiritual center in Zion. Well, that was one considered response to the dilemma of the diaspora Jew after 1948. Another was proposed by Arthur Kerstler. With the clarity of the chopped logician, he maintained that the establishment of Israel presented Jews with a clear choice. Either move to Israel and participate fully in the recreation of Jewish nationhood, or remain in exile and stop being Jewish. And he opted uh, for the latter. He, uh, for a, a Gordian cut, he announced his intention uh, to resign from the Jewish religion and the Jewish people, in, in effect. Well, not in effect, in theory, uh, one might say. Um, Kessler disputed the idea that Jews shared any kind of distinctive cultural tradition. He quoted with approval the pronouncement of Arnold Toynbee, at that period widely regarded as a sage, uh, that the Zionist Jews, this is Toynbee speaking now, are a fragment of a fossil of alien origin which has been embedded in the body of Western Christendom since its postnatal, sorry, its prenatal days. Rejecting, this is now Kessler, rejecting what he called uh, 
the metaf uh, metaphysical snobbery based in genealogical assumptions, Kostler urged that Jews who decided not to emigrate to Israel had a duty to their offspring, to their children, to rid them of the burden of Jewishness. He wrote, people have an inalienable, in inalienable right to mess up their own lives, but no right to mess up the lives of their children just because being a Jew is such a cozy mess. Uh, by the way, Kirstler had no children of his own. Uh, now, Kirstler was not alone in that sort of attitude. Many so-called assimilationists had arrived at a similar terminus, albeit by different routes. For example, the American literary critic Lionel Trilling, whose intellectual reputation and influence were at a peak, at their peak at around this time with the publication of his um, of his uh, book, The Liberal Imagination. What was unusual about Kessler's position was that he adopted it fr coming from an explicitly Zionist standpoint, accompanied by a burst of publicity. Now, Kessler's radical position was denounced both by Rabidovitz and by another formidable critic, the Oxford philosopher Isaiah Berlin. And here we come to the fourth potential framework of understanding, of which Berlin was perhaps the most uh, influential exponent in the period, uh, namely liberalism. Berlin presented the clearest enunciation of his liberal philosophy in his famous inaugural lecture, Two Concepts of Liber Liberty, in 1957. His conception of liberty involved more than just a negative freedom from, if you like, individualism, but also a positive, expressive freedom to. Now, those two concepts of liberty might not be compatible, or to use Berlin's terminology, commensurable, but Berlin regarded both as natural human inclinations. Unlike Kessler and Trilling, who felt imper impelled to shake off any Jewish connection, Berlin was a lifelong advocate of a, of a Jewish state, and he was close to Chaim Weizmann and other Zionist leaders. But he was never tempted to become an Israeli citizen, and he rejected Ben-Gurion's notion that by remaining in the diaspora, a Jew was somehow less complete. Deploying against Kerstler, this is Berlin now, his favorite quotation from Kant out of the crooked temper of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. Berlin argued that many individuals in the world do not choose to see life in the form of radical choices, to which Kessler responded, the liberal in retreat does not ask for freedom of choice, but for freedom from choice. And he went on, I still think it more honorable to try to straighten the timber than to make it more crooked, crooked for sweet crookedness's sake. Well, the first three frameworks, Judaism, Marxism, uh, Zionism, uh, all offered a utopian vision, promising a form of redemption. They were all, in a sense, totalitarian, or if you like, hegemonic thought systems. Religious orthodoxy ordained unflinching adherence to the 613 commandments. Communism required unquestioning un, un, <coughs> fealty to the party. Zionism's first commandment was Aliyah, and as recent Israeli historians such as Orit Rosin and others have shown, in the early years of Israel, it also demanded, even if it didn't always achieve, subordination of individuality to the imperious demands of the new state. Liberalism, the number four, liberalism was different. It required no such surrender of self. On the contrary, its ideal was the maximization of individual opportunity and expression. And whereas the other three were dogmatic faiths, liberalism again was different, as Bertrand Russell put it in 1947. The essence of the liberal outlook lies not in what opinions are held, but in how they are held. Instead of being held dogmatically, they are held tentatively. 
and with a consciousness that new evidence may at any moment lead to their abandonment. Judaism, communism and Zionism all struggled for hegemony in the Jewish world after 1945. Liberalism's struggle was against hegemony itself. The first three gods all failed to win more than a minority, more than minority followings, at any rate in their full sense, minority followings among Jews after the war. The fourth, in, in fact, proved the most popular option. In the liberal democracies, where Jewry was now heavily concentrated, a majority of Jews combined liberalism with watered-down elements of the other three doctrines. As far as religion, number one was concerned, conservative or reform Judaism in, in the United States or nominal orthodoxy uh, in most other countries. In, uh, in, in politics, um, continuing support for the moderate left, even as Jews rapidly ascended the socioeconomic scale. And support for a form of Zionism expressed as philanthropy and political lobbying rather than Aliyah. Between 1945 and roughly 1967, Berlin's synthesis of liberalism and vicarious Zionism pro helped provide an intellectual basis for this new paradigm for diaspora Jewish life. Kessler no doubt had a point. It was something of a cozy mess, yet for most Jews of the post-1945 generation, it worked. The cozy consensus lasted for about a quarter of a century. From the end of the 1960s, an accumulation of dramatic changes caused it to fray and then dissolve. And those included, to mention but a few, the explosion of youth counterculture, the feminist revolution, the rise of the neoconservatives in the United States and in France, the Soviet Jewish revolt, the growth of Holocaust memorialization as a mobilizing force for Jewish identification, the decline in Israel's moral reputation, rightly or wrongly, the transformation of orthodoxy into what Chaim Soloveitchik has described as a set of enclaves rather than cultures, practicing what he calls a text-based mimetic stringency, where a way of life has become a regula and behavior once governed by habit is now governed by rule. That's quoting Chaim Soloveitchik. Uh, and finally, among these changes after the late 60s, consequent religious polarization among Jewry in general. And against this background, the ideological clashes of the early post-war period came to seem quite quaint or remote. Perhaps for a deeper understanding of those conflicts, we should return from prose to, poet, to post Auschwitz poetry. Allow me then to conclude by quoting some lines by one of the foremost Jewish thinkers of the period. Better known as a scholar than a poet, Gershom Scholem. He was, of course, a Zionist. But writing in February 1967, the, these lines of verse, he expresses not exhortation or exaltation, but rather a mixture of distress skepticism, resignation, and disillusion, and above all a sense that utopian visions, in which of course he was an expert, while certainly not futile, are never fully realized. At least that is my reading of these lines. We'll see if you agree. The poem is addressed to the German poet Ingeborg Bachmann following a visit that she had paid to the ghetto in Rome. I shall read the English translation of the whole poem, it's not very long, and then, since poetry rarely works its magic ad adequately in translation, I'll read the first and last stanzas in Scholem's original German. In the ghetto you saw what few can see, and what memory too easily mislays, that nothing that happens is entirely fulfilled, that evening has not yet fallen on all the days. <coughs> it is the oldest of those ancient tidings which we read in the prophet's words. We Jews have always remembered this news, though the price we paid has been absurd. We have existed in the rifts of history, 
taking shelter in what is never quite closed. The final day was the focus of those visions, from which in exile we drew our hopes. For all days have an evening in the end. Yet there was a promise of, except, of exemption, the final evening soothing us, consoling us, in gathering all the rays of redemption. So the spirit of Utopia spoke to us, where consolation darkly joins with fear. But instead, we fell into melancholy, finding solace only in tears. Zion's messengers speak to us of elation, but we can never quite return back home. Though we were once filled with anticipation, this call to homecoming cannot be restored. The message that called us home reached the ghetto far too late. The hour of redemption is over. The final days decline too plain. Now the first and last stanzas. Im Ghetto sahst du, was nicht jeder sieht, und was sich draußen allzu leicht vergisst, dass nichts ganz voll erfüllt ist, was geschieht, das noch nicht aller Tage Abend ist. Die Botschaft rief zur Heimkehr uns hinüber. Sie hat das Ghetto viel zu spät erreicht. Die Stunde der Erlösung ist vorüber. Der Untergang am letzten Abend leicht. Thank you.